Okay, hold on to your hats, folks. This is a big one. Last time we looked at the ride home and I was stressing almost minimalism, EQ, compression, with that done, any delay, maybe some modulating effects, embellish from there once you've made your neat little tonal dynamic package for each sound. Not much has changed if we fast forward a couple of years between making the ride home and making this track. Links in the description by the way if you've not heard it why are you even here go and listen to the song come back so let's go the other way around this time let's start on the mix first i've pretty much got everything frozen on this mix because it's it's a big one and it pushes the cpu something rotten um and as i discovered last time running the screen capture in quick time whilst also doing this looking at big logic projects starts to make my rather old apple mac start to fall over i actually just want to talk through a few basics because not a lot has changed in my approach this is just what works for me it's how i've become comfortable working it might work for you it might not either way knowledge is power it's better to know about it and not need it than need it and not know about it right so let's have a look um let's start start off with the drums it's a different drum drum set but the principles are the same so um this time i'm using battery four which I don't believe is frozen, so we should see it. Yep, there we go. For all intents and purposes, honestly, it's a lot like Battery 3. It's just had a major facelift and some new features. But you load your samples in, you can treat each sample individually. Um, you can output each sample to... Oof, that's big. You can output each sample to somewhere different, um, which is exactly what I've done. So I've just got the one drum machine, which saves uh, CPU which is very important when you start running in, in into sort of 20, 30, 40, 50 tracks um, and you can see here that battery is outputting on all these different um, instrument buses that that's what they refer to it as in, in Logic and um, yeah I've got stuff all over the place um, EQ, 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 it's on compression two EQs on this one, what's that? That's my hi-hat, I must have had a particular. This is something called, uh, here we go, this is the Q10. That's a, uh, another Waves thing that I got when I got some other Waves plugins. This is, uh, you can just do like the, the tiniest, tightest, narrow little EQ cuts. So that's obviously dealing with something that the HEQ wasn't able to get, something that was bugging me. But anyway, EQ compress. EQ, compressed delay, EQ delay, whatever. That's, the drums are all there. And if we solo the drums and listen to, from say the chorus. It's quite a lot of funny things going on there. Quite a lot of sort of tuned or almost tuned percussive sounds. Um, uh, but again, EQ. There's one or two bits with delay. I've got some pitch correction on the 808 cowbell. That, I'm, that's just, I'm retrospectively tuning it there as opposed to tuning it in the sampler. Tuning it in the sampler changed the length and I wasn't happy with that. So instead I went with the pitch correction retrospectively. And sort of similar sort of story really. Once we've got things shaped the way we want it, I've gone a bit more bit more into the kick we've got one two three eqs so uh, let's have a let's have a look at those quickly okay so the first eq there I've, i'm using the q10 because it's just got tons of parameters and I'm, I'm clearly carving specific things that were bugging me and i'm guessing that yeah did this is my initial one and then i realized this wasn't being precise enough so i i went in with the q10 and placed that up before it to deal with a few other things um, and then even after that clearly I'm still having a lot of trouble with 295 or 300. 300's actually a bit of a spot um, if I did have like a few specific tips and tricks 
pay attention to 300. 300 is a frequency area that can be bloaty um, a lot of the time. And you'd be amazed at how much space you can find in a mix if you just kind of focus on addressing 300 hertz. I'm kind of using a very broad stroke here and every mix is different, but something to consider. 300 is a, is a number to remember. And then finally dealing with using the C6 just to monitor some of those low frequencies there. One of the big differences here on the drum kit to compared to the Ride Home, which... Um, Honestly, I don't know yet how I'm scheduling these videos, but I recorded it last night, so it's fresh on the mind. The J37, oh, I love this thing. This plugin is insta warmth. You know, it's like you want something warm, do you want that low end to just kind of gel and glue? Um, hey, and it's got very nice fancy pants graphics where the, where the spools turn around on the tape machine, which I guess whilst doing screen captures, um, CPU can't handle it. My Mac is like nine years old, so we will forgive it. This plugin is, it's a beast. And if I'm not mistaken, I think I've also got it on my main mix. Yes, I have over here on the main mix, the J37. It's great. So keeping it minimal, keeping it simple, EQ, compress, can't stress that enough. I've got a bunch of extra percussive things. So there's tambourine, a vibra slap. You gotta love a vibe, you know, the vibra slap. Yeah, who doesn't like one of them? That was always a primary school when you're all allowed to get one instrument from the percussion box. Everyone wants the vibra slap because got some chimes. The older I get, the more I'm using these on transitions. I, I, I just can't get enough of them. They're, they're really dreamy and so effective, so powerful. We've got a triangle over here. Super low in the mix there. That's probably barely even coming through. It's there nonetheless, just putting a tiny bit of high, high frequency energy. I reckon that the tambourine and the triangle there, because they're audio. I've got those from Logic's drummer channels. If you're not familiar with Logic, it's got this great automated drummer feature, which I think if you're starting out or if if you're just in need of stuff quickly, um, it, it really is effective. It, it makes up for the terrible mess that was Ultrabeat. Now, sitting behind the drummer, uh, the automated drummer feature, is ultra beat um, it's basically a, a new user interface where it will make the drum beats for you i don't use it i want total command over exactly where every single thing is hit however i do use it for percussion just want to throw congas in there and just leave them to do their thing or you want to throw a triangle or a tambourine or something you pull it up you go through the percussion select what you want deselect all the other bits so it's just doing the one instrument you want it's normally uh it's just a front end for either ultra beat or the exs24 which is logic sampler it's cpu it's processor so um as soon as i'm happy with that i tend to print it a uh, bounce in place they call it in logic um so so that that kind of handles that so let's keep moving along the mixer here bass let's let's check out what we're doing on the bass here mm. Super squelchy. Oh, that's delicious. Let's pull the analyzer up and just have a look at what that bass looks like. Because, oh, yeah. You can see it's got that juicy big kind of 5 to 10k squelchiness going on there. Um, That's again from the Jupiter 50. Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna get a lot of that tonight, um, but we'll just roll with it. It's okay. Welcome to my world. And that's got that's got a few things on. Again, I'm probably wrestling and wrangling all the EQs on that just to get that sounding exactly right. So we can see I've got the Q10 and the HEQ, and then. Let's zoom in on this side, it's probably a bit hard to see. We've got the Q10 up the top here, and then there's the HEQ. 
and then the C6. That's the multiband compressor that will be handling the tonal dynamic before going into the regular compressor, which is just managing that overall picture that I've shaped with the tone. There's then two logic compressors, they will be side chains. One will likely be side chaining against. Let's have a look at what we've got up here. I've got a side chain that's pumping on two and four, and I've got a side chain that's pumping on four, four. So chances are that that bass is, let's just have a look. Okay, so both those compressors are going the whole time. So I'm gonna guess it's the melody line. Um, somewhere one of the melody lines is side chaining or rather the bass is side chained against one of the melody lines so when that's playing the bass is just giving it a bit of space um, I think there might be spots in this song where the bass kind of is mirroring or playing in unison with the with the top line so that's probably where that's happening let's keep working our way through this mixer here see if there's anything that stands out EQ compression Sidechain compression, sidechain compression, EQ, multiband compression, compression, sidechain compression, amp emulator, so that would be my guitar. The amp is just Logic's amp emulator, um, no complaints. Um, I've, I've since making this song, I have invested in uh, that. That's a Boss GT001. It's a tiny tabletop version of the GT100, which is quite a kind of iconic. Uh, gigging guitarists pedal board that kind of is a jack of all trades um, and it's got all the like all the boss built in effects so I, I find that things like the chorus and the delays and the amp emulation in that just a just a smidgen more authentic um, and I'm a bit of a Roland fanboy and Roland owned boss so it, it, it's kind of it's part of the family amp EQ multiband compression compression tail chorus and then I've got a final channel e Logic's channel EQ on that now normally if I slap Logic's channel EQ at the end um, it's because I've got everything shaped exactly the way I want it and then I've decided I want to do kind of high pass low pass filter sweeps kind of make it go all muffled and then open up and for the drop that sort of a thing um, so if you ever see Logic's channel EQ at the end of the channel strip like that it's because it's purely there with the low pass filter moving up and down. And occasionally I've just spotted something in the sound and rather than try and go back up the signal chain to address it, I'll be lazy and just slap another thing on the end and deal with that one. Right, let's keep going on. Okay, more things. We've got EQ compression chorus, EQ compression sidechain compression, EQ compression, sidechain compression that's not been frozen. So let's have a sneaky little look at that. Where's that? Oh, hello. It is frozen, but it's blue frozen, which I th think means that the edits are frozen, but the plugins aren't. Mm, yeah, it's letting me open them up. Um, yeah. Not a particularly exciting EQ curve, very functional. Top ends out, bottom ends out, 200's a problem. And, oh, I tell you what, that's something I didn't mention in the last video. Most of my EQs are subtractive. Um, I'm not boosting stuff, I'm taking stuff away. The human ear is vastly more sensitive to increases in amplitude against decreases in amplitude. We greatly notice an increase in something compared to a decrease. So if you're gonna turn the frequency down in a sound, it's gonna keep that sound feeling very natural and unaffected and like it hasn't been tampered with. Whereas if you're gonna boost stuff, it very quickly starts to feel, I don't know, exaggerated or or, or tampered with or, or hyper real or I don't know, however you wanna think of it. Um, I don't know if I'm explaining myself very well, but. It's, it's, it's a bit of a mind game and it's kind of to do with our interpretation of sound and the, the actual biology of our ears. So the way I always approach EQ, I know that what I want to hear exists within the sound already. And in order to bring it out, I'm just gonna get rid of or significantly reduce 
the other things around the sound, the things that are less desirable or, or that I don't want so much. So, so you, you can see here, nothing's boosting. I'm not boosting any of the frequencies whatsoever. I'm subtracting, I'm subtracting, I'm ignoring tiny sub subtraction and another subtraction. And I'm scooping in the top and the bottom ends. Nothing's boosted. And, and that's very typical of the way I approach EQ. I, I generally don't boost. It's different if you're working with analog gear. I've used some really nice mixing desks, like Audion desks and TL Audio desks, Toff desks, and, and, and even like small EQ console things like, like Neve and SSL things. <laughs> Not with any of my stuff, unfortunately, but, but through work. And yeah, on, on analog gear like that, man, you can, you can just like push something 15 decibels and it still sounds warm and rich and, and pretty. Um, oh, the cat's here. Are you coming? Come on. So yeah, you can push it on analog gear. You try doing that in the digital realm and things do start to fall apart a bit. And by fall apart, I just mean they start to get a bit harsh, a bit, I don't know. Not, not as natural sounding. I think that's one place the digital world is still yet to kind of fully crack. Um, and, and the cats come to sit on me and purr really loudly, so I do apologize if, if you can hear purring. I don't apologize, I don't really care. Cats are awesome. Right, moving on, let's see what else we got. Okay, again, more things. EQ, multiband compression, compression, sidechain compression story of my life man another eq the most boosting here this thing has this has got 2.25 decibels of boost but notice that that's even that still hasn't taken the eq curve back to the zero if we look at the zero line here so if i if i switch that off by pulling down the mid frequency there and by having the low pass on it pulls down 8 to 10k which I obviously wanted in that sound, so I've boosted just to get me back, but it's not actually gone over zero. So even where I do boost, I, I'm doing it tiny amounts of compression. Um, oh, I didn't mention this one last time, actually. This is my one of my holy grail go-tos. This is the compressor I use for musical compression versus sidechain. Logic's compressor for sidechain is wicked because it's it's so it's got so many uh, parameters uh, you can adjust everything in such detail um, this is modeled on SSL um, what's not to like SSL stuff is insanely good I've been told the universal audio one is better than the waves one I can't afford universal audio I'm making do with this um, it's serving me all right it's one of my absolute go-to's it sits on everything still look more e eq multiband compress sidechain compress eq multiband compress sidechain compress tau chorus eq multiband compress side sidechain compress sorry multiband compress compress sidechain compress it, this is just this is it the, the, I'm, i've not got fancy trickery there's no there's no special awesome secret plugins that make things extra special um, we've got double sidechain compressions going on, some channel EQ for up down filtery sweeps. Um, over here, tape delay, got a lot of tape delay, that channel's got a noise gate on it. DX, that's some of the patches on the Yamaha DX are filthy. Um, I don't know, it's almost as old as me, that synth. Um, and just like I've lost all my hair and my beard's going grey. Um, that thing's got a few quirks and imperfections, but hey ho. And so yes, yeah, some of the patches on that just come out sounding really, there's there's like proper gnarly high frequency digital noise. So I've just slapped the noise gate on that for those addressing those tiny little bits between where there is sound and where there isn't, but I can't be bothered to go through and edit out every single bit of the sound wave. This is, this is it guys. This is just like in my other video, I'm EQing, I'm multiband compressing, I'm compressing, and that gets me that nice, neat little package of a sound that's gonna sit where it needs to sit in the mix. It's not about getting every sound as wicked and lovely as it can be. It's about getting each sound into the shape and size it has to be to sit in your mix. Over here, uh, I've 
got my my um, reverb. It's this is a this is a reverb patch I use all the time. It's one of my custom ones. You'll notice it's just got this funny EQ curve on it, but it works. The top that the top ends cut out because often if you send that really top end stuff into your, into your reverb, it gets a bit. It starts to run away a bit and it can make the reverb sound a bit messy. We've scooped big at 280 or we'll round up to 300. I mentioned 300 earlier. That low mid area can be an issue. Again, in reverb, you reverb that too much, everything starts getting woolly. These, the parameters to manage this do exist within the reverb itself. However, this again ties into my whole ethos about EQ and that EQ is the most important cornerstone of everything. Why try and rely on a simple high cut and a simple low cut dial and the dampening dials? Why, why make work for them when I've got four band parametric, two shelves and high pass, low pass? I can just slap that in front of it and I can really dial in exactly the frequencies I don't want to hear. I can carve them out, thus giving my reverb plugin a lot less work to do and ensuring that it just produces the goods I want to hear. EQ, I, I cannot stress this enough, it is absolutely the cornerstone of what enables you, empowers you even, to shape, craft and control your mixes after arrangement arrangement is king but we'll come back to that. on this track i am rocking the sidechain compression sidechain two and four every second beat the sidechain is pumping on the reverb now the upshot of that is the snare the snare that's what's on two and four man and so yeah you sidechain everything out from the snare, you make the snare the centre of attention. And maybe it's because growing up in the 90s, 90s hip hop snare drums are just, mm. and I've always, always kind of prioritised getting a snare kind of hit. Often you double it with a clap or some other kind of tonality, a room shot or something, but you get that right. And then if you sidechain everything on just the two and four, so everything's in the mix on one and then on two when that snare hits we've got we've got that space and it's just like everything snare everything snare over to the main mix oh there's a second there's a second giant reverb i'm guessing that's just for like ah that's my big 808 claps remember back in the previous video on the ride home i mentioned i used the 909 claps as like a double up on my snare just to give it that extra little texture um and then at specific times the 808 clap which doesn't quite have that <clears throat> doesn't have that kind of slappiness that the 909 clap has it's a bit more white noisy um, and so you just get that and into a really big reverb um, and I'm, I've got my snare on that either as a default from one of my own templates or um, it's automated I've got gain on my main mix again there's a uh, this little bad boy here, this is a great plug. Uh, this is the Isotope uh, Imager. And what it does is it, it allows you to adjust the stereo width according to frequency spectrum. Now, this is typically something that happens at the mastering stage. But, um, I don't know, I decided I'd start just doing this um, at the kind of final stage of my mix. I guess it's one less thing for the mastering engineer to worry about. I guess the, the better the better and more finished a product you can send to your mastering engineer, the better. Um, so just to give you a quick rundown on what it does. It's showing us the stereo image. And you can see everything here below 140 is completely monoed. And the way to think about the stereo picture with regards to uh, frequency is that frequencies play a psychological effect in that low frequencies feel heavy, they feel weighty. So if your bass, if your low frequencies are 
slightly one way or slightly the other way or it's some weird super wide thing where it feels like it's out at the extremities but not in the middle in the imagined kind of third eye or <laughs> third ear of 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 your perception it it offsets your the whole kind of the gravity of your mix so if if you can just mono everything at the bottom of the mix think of it like a tree you know you got starts there and then it grows up and out yeah so the higher you go up the frequency spectrum this is the way i work anyway the higher i go up the frequency spectrum typically the wider i'm willing to send things so if there's really little twinkly things they can exist way out on the far left and the far right um and then as we come down into the lower mids i'm still prepared and willing to push them out but not to the extremes um, and this is something that whilst i'm taking care of that with my pan picture and where i'm putting things left right this is like a safety net this is just guaranteeing that nothing from any of the synth patches have got some weird low things flying off um, um, and then EQ C6 SSL compressor um, so EQ multiband compression compression um, after I fixed any potential Im issues with the stereo imaging and then last the very last thing in the mix that bad boy again the J37 it just kind of softens the top end whilst also kind of like gluing the low mids together it's a wicked plugin. This is one of my go to guys. Let's look at the arrangement. We'll look at the arrangement and we'll look at the stereo picture. Kind of already some of the same techniques deployed as on that last song we looked at, uh, The Ride Home. There's, there's like a drone there, right? That's just texture, atmosphere. And then the bass, the bass is very much mirroring, mirroring this synth brass, which is filtered right down at this stage. Lots of sparse little things here. Just throwing little teasers in. Right. That's quite big. This is all quite tense. This whole opening bit is building tension. You've got a drone, bass, very stripped out, very minimal, no rhythm section whatsoever. The occasional cheeky guitar to kind of like tease stuff. Where is this going? What's going on? I milk that for 49 seconds. That's, that's quite a long time in, in terms of like a pop song, you know? Um, if a song's going to be three and a half minutes, that's a sizable chunk already gone. Tension and atmosphere, not a lot in there. You build that, you double down on that by filtering off. Um, you know, everything's muffled and, 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 and I've automated it to really send off into the reverb. So we've got this unclear thing existing around in the reverb. No one quite knows what's going on, why, where are we. You, you bring it in, you bring it into focus. You, you rein in that reverb, you open up those filters. And then you hit them with a, a very big 80s drum fill, which we will look at here. So here's your toms, yeah? Now, what you can see here is that I've got, I've got Two notes very close to each other, that's a flam. Um, you may remember in the last video, I stressed the importance of making sure you keep grace notes. And if you can't play them, honestly, you can draw them in, but practice a bit, you'll get the hang of it. Get those grace notes on things, uh, on your synth leads and stuff like that. It really brings that human element in because you listen to any seasoned keys player and they're dropping grace notes left, right and centre. It's just a very effective means of expression. And the flam is kind of like the drummer's equivalent of a grace note. 
rather than just boom, boom, you know, you just get those two hits in really quick, like, and you get it a lot on Tom Fields. And if you can replicate that in the MIDI, how I've done here, which honestly, you draw a note, drag a duplicate of it, a fraction across. I'm like, that's not done to any grid division or quantization. I've just manually just dragged it across a little bit and I've made it a touch louder. Um, and if you're unsure ever how to phrase velocities, just tap it out on the table in front. Like if you're gonna tap a flam, Blah, blah. I tend to find that my second my second hit is louder. It, it, it's crude, whatever. Someone might argue that the first note should be louder, but whatever. It's working for me. I'm quite happy to keep keep rolling with that. Bam, ba -da -da -ba -da -dum. And again. Okay, those tom hits are not, they're not with the synth. The synth's coming on the one, look. The toms are always one sixteenth after the synth hits, so those big kind of that's syncopation. It's all about tight control, filling the space with sort of, I guess, approaching your timing the same way you're approaching that EQ compression mentality where you EQ and compress to make everything this neat little package arranged the same way. I could have just gone dum, 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 and put the toms with the things, but with the synths, but the synths and the toms combined in that moment would crowd each other out for a start. And, and then you're, you're forcing the listener to have to decide what they're gonna focus on. In this instance, we're only talking 1 16th, right? So it, it's a minuscule amount of time, but it's enough for, rather than giving the listener duk, 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 dum, and making them kind of oh what everything's happening on those things you get da -da 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 -da. there's bounce you know you, you kind of throw in the listener dum, do -da -da -dum, do -da -da -dum. and it's it, it kind of makes it a more stimulating more exciting and energetic passage and again look remember what i said about throwing stuff in and then muting it and getting rid of stuff. I've done a similar fill there, but I've actually cut some bits out to put space. So there's a whole like half beat pause just here in this little space where I've muted it. Right, let's listen to the drums and what they're doing. It's all quite straight. Again, pauses, pauses, negative space. It's so important. Just put things in, take things out. And, and software sequences are great to enable you to speed up this process. You can make a one or two bar loop that's awesome, loop it indefinitely. And then in what I do in Logic is right click, convert loops to regions. They're now all duplicates. And then every second or third bar, you just go in, chop a load of things out, make some changes, move some things around, put some pauses in, put some gaps in, put an extra hi-hat fill in, something, anything. Put that variety in. Um, but because I tend to be of the mindset where I start out by making it really big and then I carve it away and put all that space in. So this is the, this will be the beat I've programmed. And, and all I've done is go in and either mute or delete. Let's see. Uh, yeah, there you are, they're still there. It's still there. I've just, I've grabbed an entire kind of like eighth of the bar and muted it and then and chop the tambourine out at that point and I'm guessing the much of the musical arrangement it, that's following the musical arrangement yep I've got 
stuff's going boom, boom. Something in there is doing a tune, but I can't see it. Um, I've actually, because of CPU, after doing all my edits with fades, I've actually had to bounce in place and print, print those edits to the final finished product. So I guess in a way there's a bit less to show you, but we'll follow our ears because that's more important than our eyes anyway with this stuff. They can tell us everything we need to know. Let's put that one item in there. So you make a thing of the guitar. And e even things like that little bass run there, right? And this bit. Make sure there's space for that. Don't put other things in there. You know, I, I can well imagine that when I'm writing this, I had other synth lines follow that. And no, it's, it's messy, it's clutter. Just give it to the bass, let it have its moment. Guitar, that's pretty self-explanatory. It's me stretching the limits of what I can do with the guitar. No doubt that would have been flexed. Boom, 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 boom. Yep, and then we got the actual piano in there. Right, this piano. It's super synthy, super like early 90s house, kind of quite cheesy, but in these sorts of mixes, honestly, you can just, you play it in, you can go in, quantize it super rigid, spam all the, all the velocities up to 127, so they're all bright red, and just, you know, it's the most artificial, gnarly sounding like piano in its own right. But in a mix like this, it almost has that sort of uh, chic, you know, Nile Rogers chic kind of disco-y funk piano vibe to it. Um, it's quite low in the mix, but let's see if we can pick it out. Let's have a look at these strings. These come from the Jupiter. Um, the Jupiter has some good. They were better, obviously, but I mean, crikey, for 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 where it sits in the market in terms of since um, it's got some really good real instruments in it as well. It's got something called the Supernatural Engine. I can't remember if this is technically a Supernatural patch, but there are some on the brass. It's like real-time analysing your inputs and making that instrument sound respond in the way that the real thing would, based on like slurring notes and stuff. Um, I, I, I use it for my electric bass or uh, bass guitar on a, all of my stuff that has bass guitar sounds on. Um, because it, it can do things like hammer-ons and quite realistic sounding slap bass at times. So, But we'll look at that in another track. But anyway, strings and then the brass here, which I've got a feeling will be the supernatural. That's like a classical, like, disco, you know, just just on the octave. Excuse me, the cat is snoring. I do apologise if you're picking that up. Um, let's listen to those horns one more time. So, yeah, we've got patch 1925, patch 1905 and 1906. I'm going to guess that 1925 is like a, a more synthy one, whereas 1905 and 1906 are the supernatural ones. And you can hear like the, the valve of the mechanism when the note changes. 
it's subtle but it's in there and the swells work nicely um, it, they're good quality pouches and and there's only so much you can do before you push them beyond realism um, and I'm kind of staying within that to keep that authenticity and not have it turn into sounding like a karaoke backing track or something. Do you remember in the last track I talked about using bells to follow key melodic notes? Uh, I'm doing it here again. I've got bell 415. You know, and it's 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 just a tiny little delicate texture in the high frequencies up the top of the mix there, which there it is. Gotta love it. There's the Yamaha DX21. remember that one from the ride home yet um, I'm doubling it with some kind of like late 80s wavetable pan pipey flute lead thing I mean it's so cheesy like I'm, it's it's almost going in there as a meta joke on like this whole culture of romanticizing this the super cheesiness of of the 80s and early 90s which I love you know, don't get me wrong, that's my childhood. Of all aesthetic renaissance, renaissance, renaissance is to have, this is the one. And I'm glad I'm here for it. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, it's quite funny. Um, yeah, anyway. Those two things work nicely. The, the breathiness of the pipe just sits behind the kind of the pluckiness of the, of the DX marimba. Um, and I, I'm guessing, I'm not even panning those. Those are, they're, they're down the middle, they're behaving themselves, very straight, good. All right, moving on. Oh, there it is, man. Those cheeky kicks that come a 16th, or if you're working with, if you're swinging it more in 24th, let's have a look at what we got here. Yep, it's a 16th before the start of the bar. To push it, man, just like, yeah. It's a bit of sass, it's a bit of funk. I draw a lot from funk, and uh, it's it's a major component in a lot of the music I make. Um, I get asked on Twitter and stuff from time to time, like, how do you get it so funky? How do you make your bass line so funky? How do you make your drums so funky? And I'm thinking, is it though? Um, because the funk I listen to is way funkier than the funk I make. I think again it kind of ties into whatever ethos you're approaching your music making with. Music is rhythmically built on the pillars, which are the beats, the pulses of the bar. If you're in 4-4, four, four, it's 1, 2, 3, 4. If you're in 6-8, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The expectation is that you're just gonna build with those four pillars, right? Or six pillars, or whatever your time signature is. Now, the funkiest thing to do is to subvert expectations. So don't always do it, you know, give people that 4-4 four, four most of the time and then, you know, blindside them with something that's on one of the other little rhythmical intervals, but keep it, keep it on those rhythmical intervals, keep it kind of edgy and funky and tight and... It's the simplest thing, man, we're talking 1 16th and how much does it make that whole transition pop, like... Did it again there. Right, at this point, when I'm writing, <laughs> I'm normally like, I don't know, I've come up with like a couple of bars of a melodic phrase. Which I guess is what this bit is, right? So, um... Yeah. Play it again. Repetition 
validates or whatever it is. Repetition legitimizes, that's the meme, isn't it? Anyway, uh, but you know, it's like you repeat something, but then you you got to throw some variation in. So I, I'm improvising at this stage, I don't know, I'm making it up as I go along. Um, and I'll have tracked it and gone, oh, that sounded nice, and then tidied up the MIDI, sent it out to the synth and recorded it in. One thing important to note, if you use Logic, I don't know if other doors have this, they probably do. You'll notice here I've got two record buttons. One is the record button, the other is capture recording. Um, that will just grab the very last bit of MIDI you did, provided you haven't gone around poking in other things and doing other stuff. So let's say I'm just jamming along to it and I play something and I'm like, oh, I need to, ah, oh no, can I repeat that? What did I do? Don't touch anything. Just press capture recording. It gets it. You've heard some cool melodies and some really cool flashy solos because of capture recording. So I've gone, oh, what, what was that? And, and then, you know, managed to save it. Um, and that's precisely what this sort of a moment would have been. Back into the chorus. The orchestra's back. We got the strings, we got the horns. We've also got a different approach, right? A different approach to how I'm using chords. Um, everything's just kind of heightened and everything's playing more of a role, if that makes sense. So in the verse here, there's no piano until the second half of the verse. And even when there is, chords on the beats, a couple of chords above, whatever. We get to the chorus. It's, it's doing more, like it's not a lot more, but it is more, it's changed the harmonic rhythm. It's playing in a different pattern. And that is true of most of the section. Um, and that's another, important thing to keep in mind. Again, the guitar, what's the guitar doing? It's just ding it ding And then over here. It's just, it's doing a similar sort of phrase, but it's doing it at more regular intervals. Things like the orchestra hits as well. These are a staple. I use them all the time and it's nearly always the same patch. It's from my Roland JV 1080. Big delay on that, gotta love it. Um, it's super late 80s, super early 90s, very sort of new jack swing, R&B hip hop of the era. And I, I nearly always do this, it's, it's quite scooped, the mid range is scooped out. Big reverb, big long delays, stick them in at the start of stuff. Um, they're so powerful, so effective. Got some white noise down here, Again, you can see here I've printed, well that would have been the retro synth, and I've swept up and I momentarily mute the track, again, space, right, look. Yep, okay, so if we listen. Mute it for the tom fill, let the toms have that space constantly carving space this is what i'm always banging on about you carve that space all these sounds they stop they stop on that last little bit there just to let the toms have that moment have their little time to shine and also even even up here man on this on this ep and the piano i've just been really brutal and just chopped in in time with those very staccato -y synth synth lines there super fakey artificially like you can't make the instrument sound like that naturally but boy is it effective you don't hear that artificiality in the mix it's it's um when you're listening to everything it's only when you isolate it but the effect is that it just puts so much punch and emphasis on that. In 
interesting. That's not really doing a lot, but I'm sure it's there for a reason. Oh. Ah, nice, okay. Okay, right. This is probably a good time to start looking at stereo pictures as well. So I'm guessing that these two, as I've put them next to each other, and this, the green sound here is panned a bit to the left, and this bluer sound is panned to the right, that these two are working as a kind of tonal pair to counterbalance one another. And this is something I, I've been doing more and more of in the last couple of years, is this kind of tonal balancing. If you're going to put anything a bit that side, have something of equal like harmonic quality and quantity on the other side. Not necessarily at exactly the same time, but just to balance things out. This is one of the, this is one of the things I, I, I sort of forgot to talk about when we were looking at, at the ride home. Two different bells, equal harmonic quality. If we look at this one, it's, it's a bit to the right and it's doing that. And then over on the left, a bell of similar character. Yeah. So over on the left, we've got, and over on the right, I'm taking sounds that have kind of more in common than they do difference, and I'm using them as counterweights to one another, um, and that way you create an interesting stereo picture that doesn't ever get lopsided. Let's move on. Big dramatic change again. Pauses, gaps, nothing on beat one. Kicking on the two, again, subvert expectation. That's, that's the funk right there again, even though it's dead straight on the beat. Just by not having something on the one, it's a bit funky. This is a point where it's like, okay, I, I need something a bit different. Um, and it's normally put the groove in, just keep it cooking. And I just spend a bit, few minutes on the keyboard noodling and get a few takes of things and see what sounds best. Da 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 da. That's kind of playing with the measures a bit there, isn't it? Because it's almost into like triplety things. And also like the rhythm section wouldn't have had that like little like pause and funk and that finger click and that wasn't there when I do the solo. I've just, I've given myself a basic groove on which to do the solo. I've done the solo and then gone right, how can I support the solo with everything else in the mix? Most of the time that comes from just chopping things out. Occasionally I'll then revisit a line and um, harmonize or, or do something in unison with a particular tiny phrase within the solo just to make that one little beat or that one bar of the solo really pop in this instance. I kind of pull the rhythm section out, put in a random finger click and there's a cheeky little sequencer -y sound that I added there for that section. Everything back in and it goes back in with a orchestra hit because orchestra hits for the win. And then just getting all a bit cinematic on that. A bit of a flashy run. It's all kind of blue scale, pentatonic-y, minor pentatonic-y stuff. Uh, it's quite fast, 
but it's it's not particularly inventive um, and I guess in a way to kind of slightly dress it up a bit more because it's not very jazzy or not very inventive uh, and it's just kind of noodling on the blues scale I've put those strings under it just to kind of sell it a bit more it's kind of all sizzle and no sausage if uh, you know what I mean Middle eight. Uh, I've come out of the solo and I just kind of came up with some different chord sequences that were all kind of working nicely. Um, and then it was a case of trying to find a way to weave it together with some sort of a top line. And my go-to guy when I'm really stuck is the piano. You grow up playing the piano and piano is your best friend. Um, and it, it's your, your ultimate kind of go-to guy or your get out of jail free card. I've got a weighted 88 key controller. So the sounds come from the Jupiter 50, but I'm playing the piano on proper weighted keys because it's where I feel at home. I love cooked up the chord sequence and kind of thought, mm, what do I do here? And, and noodled a few things on the piano. And then once that piano is in place, that's when I start just putting in all those horn fills, all those little bits of string. That's quite an old fashioned approach. Whilst some of it is dressed up in, with very modern production techniques, when I'm doing this sort of work, I am, I'm thinking about disco. I'm thinking about late 70s, early 80s pop. I'm asking myself, what would Quincy do? Quincy Jones, obviously. I have a framed picture of Quincy Jones up there above the computer with the words what would Quincy do and that's there to serve as a reminder to myself if you're unsure just what would Quincy do keeping it realistically within the confines of what you've got at your disposal there's a new little thing down here let's have a look what's that okay oh yeah yeah I got it Repeat the intro. Bit bigger this time, I think. Right, trumpets there. I put that whole pause in just so I could put these trumpets in because on a couple of the trumpet patches on the Jupiter 50, when you do the pitch bend, it does like a full, like, octave scale and you hear all the valves on, on the instrument like bing, bing, bing. listen bing. Uh, yeah love it so I was like right yep yeah, I'm doing that they're going in and then rinse and repeat now double chorus to end and this time I'm improvising like noodling uh, on like quite a thin buzzy sounding synth with that top line we've heard the synth earlier but now I'm kind of really in the zone and having fun with it So repetition with variety. Lots of very little things. There's not one big thing stealing the show. Right, let's just look at that secondary bass line there because that does sound lovely. Oh, baby, that's fat. So that's just from the intro there. And you take it out, it's still a, 
an effective intro, but mm. that is one of those synth patches that does make you do the oof face, doesn't it? Mm. Chimes, love me some chimes, and the vibra slap, and then just fade out on that groove like it's some old funk record from the late 70s, early 80s. Oh, hello. That's something. Let's let's go back to find that where it's not in the fade out. Right, that's on the verse. I like secondary bass synth, so we've got that. Again, you take a little thing like that and you just give it its space and it becomes a thing. It becomes this like expressive two note thing and it's not, it's just some like muffly bass sound. But how you window dress that. Everything's there, we've got it. Yeah. Uh, big takeaways, carrying on the theme of what I like to do in terms of EQ compress, less is more in that sense. Just make everything its little package so it can sit where you need it to sit in the mix. From this track that we didn't talk about last time, rhythmical interplay, making sure everything has its space in the arrangement, cutting gaps where necessary, offsetting particular sounds that are going one side or the other with something of similar characteristic or equal tonal weight on the other side to create that balance. Not have too many things go on over there or too many things over the other side. Attention to detail on drum programming. Despite all of that rhythm section being very meticulous, it, it still kind of swings, it still kind of grooves because of how you're dressing everything around it, riding those bass lines and those chord sequences, subvert expectation where necessary, drop the one beat, that sort of thing. I hope that's been interesting and helpful in any way, shape or form. I think that's just about it. If I think of anything really important, I will insert text now. Um, Otherwise, this is YouTube, you know what to do. Click on the things and write in the things and do the doodars and the social media. It's a thing. <laughs> I'm there. Happy music production and uh, stay safe.